Hi AP Bio. So this first video is going to talk to you about all four investigations that we're going to be looking at throughout this week. Um, but we're also going to be looking at spectrophotometry. So if you haven't used a spectrophotometer um, last year, we are going to look at a spectrophotometer and how it works because there's going to be a lot of um, graphs. There's going to be a lot of data sets that might use spectrophotometry on the AP exam. And we're going to look at spectrophotometry just to see how it can be used to measure enzymatic activity. So um, we have um, a big agenda for this week. What this video is going to cover is how a spectrophotometer can be used to gather data not only on enzyme activity but on how substrate concentration affects enzymes. In the next video after today you're going to look in at pH and you're going to gather data from the spectrophotometer to see how pH affects enzyme activity. The third video will be on the effect of temperature on enzyme activity. And then the fourth activity is, it has no video, it just has data, and you're going to be plotting competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, and you're going to be comparing those to find out which one is um, a competitive inhibitor, which one's non-competitive, and you're going to be identifying that. So let's first look at a spectrophotometer. Um, this is going to measure how much a chemical substance absorbs light, um, and then it does that by measuring how much light passes through a sample. So notice that on the left-hand side, I have a whole bunch of test tubes, and some have a darker color than others. The test tubes with the darkest brown color have a high concentration of solute. And then the test tube all the way to the right, um, that has the least amount of solute. So a spectrophotometer is going to see how much light can pass through a sample. And by doing that, it's going to tell how much light is actually absorbed. So let's talk about those three words first. Um, reflected, absorbed, and transmitted. So Reflected means that light hits a surface and it bounces off. Reflected light explains why we can see certain colors. So um, a plant's leaf is green. It appears green to us because the green light hits the leaf of the plant, that light bounces off the leaf and then it comes to our eye. So we see that reflected light that bounces off the green leaf. That green leaf does usually does not look blue to us. The reason for that is because blue light wavelengths are absorbed by that leaf. And so it does not appear blue because all of those wavelengths are being absorbed by the leaf. And then finally, we're going to talk about transmitted light. Transmitted light goes through a sample, just like light can go through a window. And that's what we mean by transmission. So when we look at these test tubes again, the highest concentration of solute in this first test tube, that's going to have the highest amount of absorption on our spectrophotometer because light is being absorbed. It is not going through the sample. Also, we can say that this high concentration of solute is going to have a low transmittance, meaning that light's not going through. So a spectrophotometer can measure two things. It can measure absorption and it can measure transmission. We're going to collect data on how much light is being absorbed. So looking at this spec again, you're going to watch a video of me um, carrying out this investigation and you're going to see me manipulating um, certain parts of this piece of equipment. So right here, this is where the sample or the cuvette with my solution can go into the machine. This dial right here is where I can adjust the wavelength. And then finally, there is a green button and that allows me to blank the machine. So any sample, whether it be a, a clear test tube or a window, some of that light does not pass through. Some of that light is absorbed. This allows us to create a blank or allows us to tell the machine disregard the test tube and the initial solution that's in it, we only want to look for this specific solute. So that allows me to blank that machine to set 
and 100% transmittance for that cuvette or zero absorption. Because remember, if all the light is going through, 100% is being transmitted, that means that zero light is being absorbed. So let's talk about what's going on inside the machine. We talked about all the dials on the outside, but inside the machine, there is a light source. And light, that light source is condensed by a lens, and then it goes through a prism. As it goes through that prism, we can separate out the wavelengths of light into different colors. So in this example, the only color that we're choosing is this yellow wavelength. And it is that wavelength that is going to go through my sample in the cuvette. And then whatever light goes through is detected by the spectrophotometer. And it can then calculate the absorption of that sample. In our investigation, we're going to always set our wavelength to 500 nanometers. And that's kind of a bluish green wavelength. That's going to be the wavelength that our solute that we're creating through our investigation is going to absorb um, light best at. So now that we know how a spectrophotometer works, we're ready to start talking about the biology. So our spec, sometimes we call that a spec 20, it can be used to measure rates of reaction if those reactions cause a color change. And our reaction is going to cause a color change. What we're going to be looking at is an enzyme called turnip peroxidase. And see this word peroxidase right there? It ends in A-S-E. That tells me that that is an enzyme. The peroxidase enzyme that we're going to be looking at is the enzyme from a turnip. So I took a turnip, I um, peeled it like a potato, <laughs> I put it in a blender with some water, and I strained it um, multiple times to extract um, the peroxidase enzyme. Now that we have that enzyme, we're going to use that to catalyze a reaction. This enzyme, peroxidase, in the turnip cells is normally found in this organelle called the peroxisome. So we talked about a lot of different organelles. The peroxisome has specific enzymes that are necessary to break down byproducts of reactions. And one of those byproducts is peroxide. The same type of hydrogen peroxide um, that if you might put on a cut to, to heal that cut can be toxic to cells. So the peroxisome organelle contains the peroxidase enzyme that is needed to break down hydrogen peroxide. That's a lot of words that sound the same. So we're gonna go over it a few more times as we look at the other slides. So here's hydrogen peroxide. That is going to be our substrate. That's going to be our reactant. Remember, reactant is the same thing as substrate in biology if it's catalyzed by an enzyme. So what I already told you, but we're going to go a little slower because it's a lot going on, is that lots of reactions that happen in cells make this byproduct hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. That hydrogen peroxide is reactive and it's toxic to cells. And that's why we use it as a cleanser, because if you cut yourself and we put hydrogen peroxide on a wound, it's going to kill bacteria that may have gotten into your wound. Once you clean your wound with peroxide, though, <laughs> it's clean. You put some um, ointment on it and you cover it with a bandage and you're not putting hydrogen peroxide on it over and over and over again because it kills the bacteria but it also kills some of your cells and you need to go through mitosis so that you can heal that wound. So you shouldn't put peroxide on a wound over and over and over again only when um, it may have bacteria in the wound because we want to kill the bacteria. So one thing that we know is that Peroxide's made in cells, it can be toxic to them. So we need a way to get rid of that peroxide and that reaction needs to be catalyzed, needs to be sped up so that that toxin doesn't build up and kill the cell. So plant cells are protected from hydrogen peroxide because they sequester the peroxide into the peroxisome and the peroxisome is the organelle where it 
where uh, hydrogen peroxide is eliminated. So this is the reaction that we're looking at. Here's hydrogen peroxide, our substrate. The reaction that happens in the peroxisome organelle is the breakdown of peroxide into oxygen gas and water. Oxygen gas and water are not toxic to the cell, but peroxide is. We need to remove this peroxide from the cell quickly. So peroxidase is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction, means that it speeds this reaction up. So our substrate or, or our reactant is hydrogen peroxide. The product that we're going to be measuring is going to be oxygen. And then the enzyme that we're going to be adding is peroxidase that I extracted from the turnip. So we talked about how the spectrophotometer can, use to, um, can be used to measure reaction rates if it creates a color change. Um, this creates a problem for us because the reaction that we're looking at, hydrogen peroxide, clear, oxygen gas, invisible, <laughs> and water is clear too. So there's not really a change in color with the reaction that we're going to look at. So what you're going to notice is that I'm going to add an extra additive to these test tubes. And the additive that I'm adding is glycocol. This is an extract from, um, from tree bark. And what that does is whenever oxygen is present, glycocol forms a bond with that oxygen and it turns into this tetraglycogol. And that tetraglycogol elicits a brown color. So we will be measuring the production of oxygen because as long as oxygen is produced, we're going to see this brown color when the oxygen reacts with the glycogol. And let's look here at a video and you can see this reaction happening and this brown color forming. So in this test tube, notice that it was clear and now it's becoming, slowly becoming browner. That's because peroxide is being broken down into water and oxygen and then oxygen is reacting with the glycogol to form that brown color. And that's the reaction that the spectrophotometer is going to pick up, that brown color change. So, after you watch this video, you're going to go back um, to your Google form and you're going to see table one. In table one, this is going to say everything that was in each of these cuvettes that was put into the spectrophotometer. Notice we have hydrogen peroxide that's put into these cuvettes, deionized water, the glycogol that's necessary for us to see oxygen, to have it form that brown color, and then this just tells us the total volume that's in each cuvette. So the only thing that's changing, notice that each cuvette gets one milliliter of glycogol, but each cuvette gets a different amount of peroxide compared to deionized water. This allows us to create a different concentration of that um, reactant or of that substrate. So in cuvette one, our concentration of substrate is 0.02%. In cuvette 2, it's 0.04%, and then we go all the way up to 0.1% hydrogen peroxide. So we're increasing substrate concentration as we go from cuvette 1 all the way up to cuvette 5. In table 2, you will see the raw data that's collected by the spectrophotometer, and then you're going to have to analyze that data. By analyzing that data, means that I want you to calculate out the reaction rate. So let's look at cuvette one. Initially, before enzyme is added, that cuvette was blanked. There's no absorption of light. But as soon as peroxidase enzyme is added, that reaction begins because it catalyzes that reaction. And you can see that absorption levels over three minutes increase. And after three minutes, our investigation is done and we get a final absorption of 0.146. Here's where I calculated the enzymatic rate or the velocity of that enzyme. And to calculate rate, 
you will see that on your AP equation sheet. And rate says just the amount of change in Y over the change in time. So what we're looking at is the change in absorption over time. So I calculated out the velocity or the rate of this enzymatic catalyzed reaction by taking 0.146, the final absorption, minus the initial absorption of zero, and I divided it by three because that's the total time that I measured that reaction for. So it's the, the change in absorption per minute. That rate or that velocity is 0 0.0487. What your job is to do now is to calculate the rest of these reaction rates for cuvettes two through five. After you calculate those reaction rates, you're going to create a graph. On that graph, you will be plotting the changing substrate concentration, and that should be on your x-axis. And then on your y-axis should be the enzymatic rate or the enzymatic velocity. When you create that graph in Excel, make sure that you use um, a scatter plot with smooth lines and markers. So here's our scatter plot. Make sure that you choose the one with smooth lines and markers so we can see those data points. Remember, you're not going and making an Excel graph with all of this raw data right here. No. You're only graphing what is in gray. So at the top, the cuvette and their substrate concentration that's going to be on the x-axis and on the y-axis is going to be here, the enzymatic velocity. Things I'm going to be looking for in your graph. Make sure that you have um, your axes labeled on what they are and include units of measurement. I'll also be looking at figure captions and look here, this says figure 7. In whatever paper that student wrote, that was the seventh figure. This is going to be your first figure. So this will be figure one. And then we have a descriptive phrase that tells us about the data that we're looking at in that figure. So thank you for watching um, this video. I hope this helped. If you have any questions, please ask in class or make an appointment with me for tutoring. And you can do that through bookings.